Okay, so now Deuteronomy basically means repetition of instructions or repeated law or second law, plain and simple. It's just basically Moses reiterating the law, Deuteronomy. He's giving the law again. Now you would think, after everything we went through so far up to this point, to Deuteronomy, all the laws, when you're reading through the books, and this would be just the fifth, as I said, the fifth book of Moses, but again, it's dealing with the law. So you would think <laughs> everything that they went through, especially after everything we talked about in Exodus, Everything that has happened, what happened to Aaron, what's going on and everything, what happened to the people that got swallowed up and uh, the plagues that happened to the people that was disobedient. You would think after everything that happened, everything these people have seen, they would get their act together and just do what God tell them to do. Do what Moses tell them to do. But they don't. You know, Moses calls them stubborn. You know, in the first couple books of Deuteronomy, he just basically reinstating the law. And really talking to the people and reminding them, reminding them of everything that took place. So now basically, let's skip here to uh, Deuteronomy 5. It says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us. Who we are of us here alive this day. Now remember the covenant he made. Let's go back to Genesis. Just to remind you, Genesis 18, it says, And the same day the Lord made the covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenzanites, and the Kadamites, and the Kadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephraims was supposed to be uh, giants, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites, and what have you. Basically, God saying, you know, the covenant is to give you the lands of these people. So, again, people are in these lands. We know the story. It's their land. I'm going to take you there. You're going to kill them all and take this stuff. So, I ain't giving you nothing. You're going to go there and kill them. But basically, the Bible, of course, would give us the assumption that God has given them the power to do so. But as we've been talking about, it's basically the real history of the Greeks, the European conquest of African territory. So read Deuteronomy 7. It says, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou go to possess it and have cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriage with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me. That they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And this part is important. It says, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. The fewest of all people. Who is it talking about? Think about that. And this is one of the things the Hebrews do not want to really acknowledge and understand what it's saying here because they can't fathom it. Now, let's go back to Numbers because I told you guys in, in Numbers to really remember this part. Let's go back to Numbers 22. It says there, and this is when Balak is basically complaining. He says, he's talking to uh, Balaam. He said, message therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor and Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people to call him, saying, behold. There is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth and they abide over against me. So this is supposed to be the Israelites. How can they cover the face of the earth if they are the fewest people? It says clearly they're the fewest people of all, the fewest of all the people. And then you look at saying these people 
cover the earth. So understand, it's giving you those pointers, those hints. We know African people is everywhere. African people cover the planet, plain and simple. We were everywhere on this planet. We were in every single continent. Everything where people are inhabiting right now, African people was there first. We understand this. So it's giving you that hint. It's really trying to get people to see the connection that the Hebrews, the Israelites, are not only black people, but also the Greeks, also the white men. So you got to understand and be able to put it into those contexts when it's given it to you. Understand it's telling you right there. There it is. We know the fewest people on the planet is the white man. Plain and simple. They came late. So now, as I said, the King James Version is different from earlier versions. It's not the same. Go back and look at the earliest versions. It's different, as I talked about. We'll get into later. But it's clearly, clearly trying to make up for or fit into history things that's happening uh, uh, that basically happened that don't fit into their biblical story. So that's one of the things that Numbers did and Deuteronomy is doing the same. So again, in, in this context, it's trying to really get people, the religious person, to believe that God was with these people to help them go out and conquer these these nations that's mightier than them. Now, you got to look at it in the context of, of uh, just people looking at it, believing in this story, just believing it's real and that it has some kind of power. But in history, in real life, you got to look at it and say, OK, well, clearly, even if you want to if you look at it from my point of view, saying, yes, we know that they were the fewest people on the planet. How did they beat us? And as I talked about in numbers, they bred these men, super strong cock diesel barbarian men that basically took us by surprise and beat us. But later on, we understood what happened because they couldn't keep doing that. They got into other parts of Africa where even their strength didn't matter because we had the numbers. So what happened? They had to wait. And we know what took place later on. If you go back and look, once they got the Arabs involved, go back and look at those depictions of the sub-Saharan slave trade. What do they have? Guns. Guns. Plain and simple. That's the only reason why they beat us. You look at those sub-Saharan slave trade pictures, they holding rifles. Plain and simple. And that's how they beat us. That's how they got us. It was the guns. It wasn't no that, you know, they had some blessings. These motherfuckers had guns. Cannons. It wasn't that these people was right or righteous. This was... Murder, it's robbery, plain and simple. So let's fast forward because when you get into the first part of Deuteronomy, and you can go read it for yourself, I'm telling you, all of it is really Moses reiterating laws. I mean, he goes back through the Ten Commandments. I mean, he's really trying to get the people to understand what's taking place and how serious this stuff is and everything that happened. So that's really the first parts of Deuteronomy. What's going on is the reiteration uh, of, the, of the laws, which is, as I said, Deuteronomy means basically to basically reiterate, to retell the laws, to really get these people to understand what they got themselves into. So let's go to 20. So Deuteronomy 20 says, when thou goeth out to battle against thy enemy and seeth horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that have built a new house and have not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicated. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and have not yet eaten of it? Let him also go return into his house, lest he die in battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and have not taken her? Let him go and return into his house, lest he die in battle and another man take her. Eight, it says, and the officer shall speak further unto the people and they shall say, what man is there that is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return unto his house. Least his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart 
And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. When thou cometh nigh unto the city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be if it make thee answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found there and shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee slaves plain and simple and if it will make no peace with thee but will make war against thee that thou shalt besiege it and when the lord thy god hath delivered it unto thy hand thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword but the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city even all the spoils thereof shalt thou take unto thy self and thou shalt eat the spoil of thy enemy which the Lord thy God given thee. So now and again, understand, this is conquest. It's robbery, plain and simple. It has nothing to do with nothing righteous or anything like that. Plain and simple is telling the people, our officer's gonna go in there and tell them, hey, this is our stuff. You're our servants. We're gonna take your wives, we're gonna take your cattle, we're gonna take this and that. Either you're gonna be cool with it or we're gonna go to war. It's just that simple. This is exactly what they're saying. And then it's saying that God gonna give them the power to beat these people. Don't fear. Don't be worried about nothing. No matter how many people it is, how big they is, we're going to go in there. Our officer's going to go in there and say this to them. And either it's going to be on or it's not. <laughs> it's crazy when you really read exactly what it's saying. So, again, these Israelites are supposed to be on their way to the promised land. Milk and honey, all that, everything supposed to be all good. But on the way, what's happening? The conquest of all these territories is taking place. So it's something more to this whole thing here. And it's crazy because a lot of people don't see it. But it says, Claire, you look at verse 15. Now, basically, after he's telling them, you know, take all the spoils and everything, it says, Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. So he's saying, even though these cities and these nations is not part of the promised land, go out and this is what you do to those nations. You go out and you take it over. You go in and say, hey, I mean, it's conquest. It's trying to give you conquest on a biblical level, on their level. Plain and simple. It's the same thing we are seeing today. Conquest. But now they're sugarcoating it differently than what they did before. Before you got the Bible. And as I said, it's used to really justify war as well. Because now you have these soldiers, modern day, grow up in churches, and they go and join these militaries and they think that's what it's about. This is God's military. This is what it's supposed to be doing. The whole thing about God and country and everything like that. And you got a freaking chaplain in the military and everything. It's real religious, believe it or not. So they think they're going out there and what they're doing to these people and what's happening is biblical. It's all legit. If it's legit in the Bible, biblical, and the military condoning it, then in the hearts and minds of these people, they doing right. Plain and simple, even though it breaks every single commandment. It's crazy when you really pay attention to it. Now, 16 saying, But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, <laughs> thou shalt save nothing alive that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites. And the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perishites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God commanded thee, have commanded thee, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods. So shall ye sin against the Lord your God, that they teach you not to do after all the abominations which they have done unto their gods, so should not, so ye should not sin against your God. So these are the verses I'll be pointing out to Christians when they talk about the Bible not really condoning slavery and murder and genocide. See, they don't read the book, so they don't know about this stuff. How many times you talk to a Christian and you tell them you're talking about slavery in the Bible and they want to sugarcoat it and make this whole thing about servants and everything like that. When the book is clearly telling you what they doing, what's taking place, how they ripping women and taking women or what have you. Trying to make it like this stuff is not happening and that woman is not being raped. Or when you got them and you, you caught them, they just basically say, oh, well, that's just the way it was back then. To blow it all. Again, you can't really get through to a lot of these religious people. But when you start giving them these verses and things like this, especially from Deuteronomy, it really, uh, really attacks their psyche and, and makes them think. So when you read Deuteronomy, this is 11, it says, And see if among the captives a beautiful woman 
and hath a desire unto her, that thou would have have her to thy wife. So if you see a woman that you like, and you want to take her as a wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thy house, and she shall shave her head and pare, thy, and pare her nails. And she shall put a raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thy house, and be well her father, be well basically me mourn, her father and mother a full month. And after that, thou shalt go into her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. Now what if she don't want to? You like her, and what if she don't want none of that? Then what? So, you're basically taking a captive woman, making her shave and all that, and after 30 days of her mourning her family, you go into her. What if she don't want you to go into her? Then what? I mean, it's rape. It's giving you rape right there. Now, 14 is interesting. 14 says, And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. Whither really means wherever she want to go. Let her go. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. 